Hello again and welcome back to the second part of the inference talk in the FSL course. So what we're going to talk about this in this episode um, is the different ways of quantifying surprise in imaging. But first I just want to do a tiny little recap of the very last slide from the previous episode, familiarize everyone. And if you remember what we had here, we had 20 Z maps, each the end result of a study. Um, we know that the null hypothesis is true everywhere here. There are no activations at all. And what we wanted was what we wanted to do. We wanted to find a threshold for the data so that only once in 20 studies do we find a voxel above this threshold, given that the null hypothesis is true. And we did find such a threshold. Well, I didn't tell you how you found such a threshold, but you know, we, we said we did. And we found the voxel here. And this is the kind of threshold we want to find. The kind of threshold that means that only once in 20 studies do we have a false positive. We do not want to have a false positive once per 20 voxels. Right. Okay. So let's not go on. So this, this is the outline you saw um, in the previous talk. And we're now going to talk about two different ways of being surprised. And the first one is the voxel-wise inference i.e. our degree of surprise or, or what we are assessing in order to see if we have an activation or not is the value in a single voxel um, and so essentially the, the statistical value in a single voxel um, and how with that with that kind of statistic we can find this threshold that we've been talking about such that only once in 20 studies do we have a false positive. And the way to do this is something called the maximum Z statistic. And in order to do to well, in order to understand the maximum Z statistic, what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thought experiment as we did in the last talk, namely, you know, imagine that we have unlimited time, unlimited money, and we can just keep repeating and repeating and repeating the same experiment. An experiment where we know that the null hypothesis is true everywhere, i.e. there is no activation. So if what we want to do when we call the control family y0, we want to find a threshold such that when we reject the null hypothesis, um, only once in 5% of the studies do we do that. Right. Now, if we reject anything anywhere in the brain, so we have a, a set score map here. Now, if you're going to reject the null hypothesis anywhere in the brain, brain, we're definitely going to reject it at the point where we have the largest set score, if that's what we're basing, we're basing it on. So here is the largest set score in this particular map, and that's a set score of 5.16. Right. So now let's do this thought experiment. That we are able to repeat this experiment where the null hypothesis is true everywhere and we're repeating it over and over every time going to look for the maximum z score anywhere in the brain and then we're recording this so this is in the first case we had a z score of 5.16 maximum in the second study we have a maximum z score of 6.84 and then in the next study, we have a maximum set score of 5.93. And note that you know the set score, the maximum set score, appears at different places in each time. That's just that's just random, and that's just the way it should be. 4.62, 7.36, etc. And we find a distribution. Right. Now, this is the distribution we want to use for our family-wise error. Because if you think about it, if you think about it. If we use this threshold here, i.e. the 5% threshold of this distribution, that means that in these 95% of the cases, we don't reject the null hypothesis anywhere in the brain. And only in 5% of these cases do we reject the null hypothesis somewhere in the brain. And that's precisely what we want. We want in 5% of the cases of of the studies because remember here each case is one full study and only in five percent of the studies do we want to reject the null hypothesis anywhere in the brain when the null hypothesis is in fact true and if you look at this distribution i mean it looks very very different to the null distribution you saw in the previous talk 
in the first of all is not centered on zero but again I mean, that's what you would expect because we took the maximum set statistics so you know you'd expect it not to be centered on zero you would expect that you know even in you know and typically you know you'd have a, a, at least somewhere a set score of four or five or something like that and that's exactly what we see and we can also see that the the, the level at what we want the threshold this is quite high and it has a little bit of a tail here so this is the distribution we want to use if we want to achieve family-wise error control. The problem is there is no known expression for it. Well, we will return to this distribution, and when I say there is no known expression expression for it, it's not completely true because there there is an expression, you know, there is an approximative expression for the tail of this distribution. Um, so we will return to this later on. But first, we're going to talk about a different way of being surprised and this is the so-called cluster wise inference we were no longer looking at the said score or, or, or a statistic in a single voxel we are instead looking at size of contiguous voxels over a certain threshold right so this is the spatial extent another way to be sense to be surprised so we talked about voxel based test and for example, in this case, we say, oh, look at that, it's a fair set value of seven. Oh, that is so surprising under the null hypothesis that I will have to reject the null hypothesis. And we say we have activation there. But quite often, this is not the case. I and mean, the data just aren't that surprising. So if you look at this map here, for example, so, uh, nothing surprising here. The largest set value is four, somewhere around here. And if you remember what that null distribution for the maximum set statistic looked like, you know, four isn't particularly um, large, so we can't really reject the null hypothesis anywhere. But what if we look at the spatial extent of clusters above a certain threshold? So let's just say now that we threshold this map at a set score of a 2.3 um, arbitrary threshold and look at the spatial extent of the clusters. And we can see that we have here a cluster consisting of 300 connected voxels all of them with a set value greater than 2.3. Well, you don't know this yet, but actually that is really quite surprising. You know, just, just by chance, you wouldn't expect to find 300 voxels, all of them with a set value greater than 2.3. So we could say, well, that's really surprising under null hypothesis, and we would have to reject it. But obviously in order to do that, we would need to know what is the null distribution of this maximum size cluster statistic. So let's look at that and, and, and again let, let's, let's do this thought experiment that we we are able to repeat the same experiment over and over and over above. You know, you know, you know, you, we, we recruit the subjects, we scan them, we analyze the data, uh, but the null hypothesis is true everywhere, i.e. there are no activations in any of these studies. Okay. So let's say we have acquired some data. What we do next is that we threshold this set map at some level, 2.3 in this case. And then what we do is we locate the largest cluster, right? Because if we're going to reject, so, so, so with a similar reasoning as we did with the maximum set statistic, we're now saying that if we're going to reject any cluster anywhere, we're going to reject the largest cluster. So what we want is we want to find the distribution of the largest cluster in the brain under the null hypothesis. So what we do is we detect or we, we, we locate the largest cluster. We look at how big it is. You know, this is 78 contiguous voxels. And we store that value away. Right? And then we do the same thing for another experiment. We acquire the data, the threshold at 2.3 and we locate and record the largest cluster, this time it's 65 voxels, and we do the same thing again. So we threshold, locate the larger cluster, this time it's 70, and then we just keep going until we have a distribution, which is the null distribution of the largest cluster anywhere in the brain under the null hypothesis. And again, this is now the null distribution we are interested in. So if you want to reject the null hypothesis based on the size of a cluster, 
this is the distribution where we want to find the 5% level. And for this particular case, it was 76. So, so if we find a cluster somewhere in the brain, given that we have thresholded it at a level of 2.3, that is larger than 76 voxels, then we say we reject the null hypothesis there. So, just as was the case for the t-values, we now have distribution f that allows us to calculate a family-wise threshold nu pertaining to cluster size. So we have a distribution called f and we have a threshold nu. But what does f and nu crucially depend on? I'll think about it for a second. f and nu crucially depend on the initial cluster forming threshold, right? So with a cluster forming threshold of 2.3, quite low, we get, a, we get a null distribution looking like this. Now, if we have a higher cluster forming threshold, think about it for a second, what do you think would happen? Well, if we have a higher cluster forming threshold, on average, the clusters will be smaller and the largest cluster will also be smaller. So that distribution will be shifted towards the left, towards smaller clusters. And if we have an even higher cluster forming threshold, in this case 3.1, it gets shifted even further towards smaller clusters. So we don't really just have one null distribution, we have a family of null distributions depending on which initial cluster forming threshold we have chosen. Now, it used to be in the past that we recommended a cluster forming threshold of 2.3 or 2.4, somewhere along there. Um, we don't do that anymore. We now recommend that you use a higher cluster forming threshold. Um, that there are various reasons for this. The reason I think is the most important is for interpretative reasons. Now, these cluster forming thresholds that you've seen here that I have exemplified, and I've calculated those from a two-dimensional case, just a single slice. Actually, the cluster forming thresholds for 2.3, for example, tend to be much larger than 76 in practice. And that means you end up with this great big cluster that, taken together, is significant, but where you can't really say anything about any particular part of that large question, that large cluster. And if that cluster falls, you know, the whole cluster falls within one broadman area, for example, no, fine, you can interpret it. But let's say you have a cluster that is 500 voxels large and it falls within three different broadman areas. And you know that, well, there's an activation there somewhere, but which broadman area is it in? And this is a, it's a in, you know, it's much harder to interpret. Whereas if you have a higher cluster forming threshold, it means you get a smaller cluster. It means that there's a much greater chance that that cluster will be contained within one particular anatomic location in brain, one particular broadman area, and it's easier to interpret. Right, so in the next episode, we're going to talk about parametric versus non-parametric tests, and that's going to be an important episode and also the longest um, episode. But um, for now, thank you for listening to this episode and welcome back to hear about parametric versus non-parametric tests.